this is the moon. In 1969, daring astronauts rode a massive rocket through the Leto radiation belt surrounding Earth. They executed perfect moves in space's vacuum, all at a chilling minus 454 Fahrenheit. And in direct sunlight, that rapidly turns to the heating temperature of 300 degrees. Against all odds, they mastered the lunar landing and returned safely. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This was humanity's greatest feat. If we take a look at the lunar module they flew in, from a distance it looks like a technological marvel. But if we zoom in a bit, it turns out that the astronauts did it in a tinfoil module wrapped in scotch tape. Not only that, but the panels don't match. It's full of holes, and according to official information, the protective walls are as thick as a soda can's wall. These brave astronauts pulled off the hardest mission in human history, and that they flew at 25,000 miles per hour through the vacuum of space, which can reach over 300 degrees in the sun. The more we learn about physics, space, and cinematography, the more we doubt the authenticity of the existing footage from the Apollo moon landings. Reaching the moon with living humans is way more difficult than it sounds. Many NASA staff members and astronauts admitted we have never even left Earth. The plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. To rule out whether we really went to the moon or not, we need to assess six aspects of the Apollo missions. And if all of these aspects match the same story, then we can safely conclude this debate once and for all. The year is 1969. A computer with the computing power of a pocket calculator is the size of your house. There is no internet, and DVDs are not invented yet. The US and the Soviet Union are at each other's throats. In schools and factories, there are daily drills on how to hide under the tables in case a nuclear missile strikes from space. With a handwritten code taller than the woman who wrote it, NASA engineers were determined to put an American astronaut on the moon. When the three astronaut heroes Buzz Aldrin, Armstrong and Collins returned, You'd expect to see enthusiastic smiles on their faces, but they weren't quite happy. I speculated on the meaning of this first landing on another body in space. Would each of you give us uh, your estimate of what is the meaning of this to all of us? Entire program, it's uh, a beginning of a new age. Perhaps they were feeling sick after the weeks of quarantine that followed their homecoming, but one would think that 
after becoming world heroes, the three astronauts would continue their promising careers at NASA. All three astronauts from the first moon landing mission, Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins, were religious. It's only logical for them not to have any problem with putting a hand and swearing on the Bible that they walked on the moon. Well, all of them refused to. Wanted to give you the opportunity to swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon. Will you put your left hand on the Bible and swear to God that you walked on the moon? Gentlemen. Mr. Cyberl. Yes? <clears throat> if you really walked on the moon, why would you not do that? So why don't you just put the $5,000 cash, you can give it to charity if you'd swear on the Bible that you Please. walked on the moon. Please. I have a tape. It'd be fine. Why don't you I swear won't. to... Why not? Why won't you do it? The interviewer even proposed to give him 5k that would go to charity if he did. He still refused. Buzz Aldrin also refused. Why don't you swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon? Please. Why don't you swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon? Why don't you swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon? What about the third astronaut? Well, Collins did the same minus the head. The interviewer certainly didn't approach them nicely, but to put an end to all speculation, why wouldn't they do it? I would have done it. I would have given the 5k to the charity and sworn. But let's refrain from the official narrative and use logical deductions for a second. Astronauts are heroes. These were the bravest and smartest people on the planet. They were all about honor and dignity, values and morality, the knights of the 21st century. How do you think would they react? if someone forced them to act in a fake moon landing. In this hypothetical scenario, they would probably resign, they would get depressed, and they would alienate themselves. Guilt would overcome them. It's what I would do if I were forced to do something like that against my values and will. It's how I would feel. But let's see what happened in the real world after the landing. In less than a year, after the first Apollo mission ended, all three of the hero astronauts resigned and sought professional opportunities elsewhere. Buzz Aldrin became an alcoholic and a drug user. Quoting him, they think of us as heroes, but the moon landing had destroyed us. Buzz Aldrin had taken part in the most important mission ever, and it had been a success. Yet listen to what he has to say to future astronauts. Space uh, and its uh, frontier certainly are new and, and challenging. Uh, and because they're new and challenging, they're also uncertain. And I think anyone aspiring that as a career field has to be equipped with a lot of patience and the ability to cope with uh, things not turning out exactly the way they may perceive that they would ahead of time. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. This makes zero sense. After all of this, Armstrong ran away to the country and refused all interviews or public communication. All three were astronauts no longer, and 40 years after the first successful Apollo mission, NASA held an anniversary celebration. Shockingly, Armstrong refused to participate. We heard what we heard. It sounds like something shady was going on. But let's not jump to conclusions based on the behavior of the astronauts alone. We're not going to look at suspicious photos you've seen a thousand times either. Instead, let's look at some authentic footage from the moon landings. If the moon landing was indeed faked, it would have been filmed in a studio here on Earth. So the biggest problem would be replicating the lunar gravity, which is six times weaker than here on Earth. In movies, steel wires are often used to demonstrate this effect. Although that looks super realistic, there is a problem with steel wires. They would sometimes reflect the studio lighting, and you could see it on camera. Let's check some footage to see if we can find similar flashes of light. Now, it's possible that this antenna reflected the light. This is the antenna. There's a second flash. There's something else there, above the astronaut.
Look at the footage from Apollo 17, the last mission. There's a light flash in the air, much higher. And since the flash above occurs after the flash below, it can't be a flare in the camera lens. This confirms that the clip was 100% filmed in a studio on Earth. But what about other videos? Perhaps some of them are authentic, but there are many instances where the astronaut would simply levitate midair or be yanked around by mysterious forces. Remember, having lower gravity on the moon does not mean the lack of such. This means objects cannot float upwards on their own. Objects would behave the same way as on Earth, just slower. and then seems to remain floating in mid-air. It looks like a puppet hanging from some invisible strings. Here, the fallen astronaut gets up from the ground as if a mysterious force were pulling him up through his backpack. Let's watch it again from up close. Here, the astronaut is working with some tools when suddenly a mysterious force yanks him upwards and to his right. Let's watch it again. There is even a situation where the astronaut complains that he cannot get up, and he almost seems to wait for someone or something to pull him up. But I can't get up. The astronaut waits until a mysterious force helps him up. There we go. In this case, the astronaut falls forward, but somehow remains suspended in midair. In fact, if we look more closely, we notice that he first remains floating in midair, then a mysterious force pulls him upwards. Here we have a case of apparent levitation. The astronaut on the left takes a leap forward and then remains floating in midair, his legs dangling while a strange force pulls him upwards. Let's watch it again in slow motion. And finally, here's a very curious situation. Look at the movement the astronaut manages to make with both his legs, first forward and then backwards, without leaning onto anything. It's as if his feet were free to slide, first forward and then backwards, on the ground underneath. If we straighten the frame in order to place the astronaut vertically, we will see that he is not just lifting himself on his toes. The entire lower part of the leg from the knee down is sliding forwards, then backwards. But how is it possible to slide with both feet at the same time, first forward and then backwards, without an external force pulling you upwards in the meantime? But does that necessarily mean the moon landing never happened? Let's go through the physics and see if it was really possible to send people to the moon with 1960s technology. The official narrative is that between 1969 and 1972, US astronauts successfully landed on the moon six times. I've never in my life doubted whether human spaceships have reached the moon. They have. Reaching the moon is entirely possible and isn't a very hard thing to calculate for MIT engineers. That's one small step for man. Something people consider solid proof that the missions were real is how authentic the audio recordings are. And since we already proved the videos were shot in a studio, let's see what we could find about the audio. It takes flight 2.6 seconds to go to the moon and come back. This is the limit of how quick our communications can travel between Earth and the moon. But in NASA's case, they received the answers twice as fast as they should have. Radio waves can only travel as fast as the speed of light, not quicker. The communication audio between the ship and the Earth base was readily available and released by spacecraft films a few years ago. In the original audio, we see that there is almost no delay between the responses. We're interested in either documented samples or rake sample there if you if you think it looks like a good area for a rake sample. Okay, I understand, Joe. The astronauts answer 
just comes too quickly, it takes less than 2 seconds in most cases. And since the light takes 2.6 seconds to reach the moon and back, this is 1 second too soon than physically possible. Obviously the audio was faked. In some cases they screwed it up completely. Look. Rover, this is Houston. Go ahead. Rover, this is Houston. Go ahead. Here it took them less than one second of response time, as if the astronaut was standing in the same room as the other person. And after several physicists pointed that out after listening to the recording, 10 years after, fabricated recordings were released to fix this mistake. But this isn't the worst part. The difficult, almost impossible feat is for astronauts to survive the trip and come back. The main reason for that is the Van Allen radiation belt, which encircles our Earth. The amount of radiation to go through the whole 58,000 deadly kilometers would kill any human, especially if they are traveling in this. Space radiation primarily consists of gamma waves, and gamma waves can be stopped by barriers of concrete, lead or water. That's why we construct most fallout bunkers with concrete, and we put lead doors on them to block the gamma waves. The Apollo spaceships were primarily constructed with very thin aluminum alloys. This means there wasn't any shielding against gamma radiation. Also, there wasn't any heat insulation to keep the astronaut from freezing or burning alive inside. So let's see what NASA has to say about these issues. The official narrative was that they devised special space blankets out of mylar. Mywire is practically a polyethylene that you wrap your ducks in on Thanksgiving. So imagine having a thin mylar blanket. According to NASA, it can somehow magically protect you from the minus 400 degrees and the plus 200 degrees outside. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. It also happens that these magical space blankets shielded the astronauts from the Chernobyl levels of radiation for 10 hours. Many questions remain unanswered, but surprisingly, some questions NASA responded to. Why we never came back to the moon, for example? Let's see what Don Petit has to say. Go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. But going to Mars should be uh, one of the next series of steps that humans do. The first step should be going back to the moon for a number of technical uh, reasons and exploration reasons and then after that Mars, maybe a uh, high orbit in uh, Venus atmosphere, maybe going to Europa. There's all kinds of uh, targets to go to places of interest in our solar system. So, according to several NASA interviews, to reach Mars, we need to overcome the radiation problems we've never solved. So, how did we go to the moon then? Any radiation dose about 4SV is little. Let's do some simple physics calculations. The Apollo aircraft traveled at 17,000 miles per hour. The Van Allen belt is roughly 40,000 miles wide. This means, with the average shielding, the astronauts would suffer anywhere between 4 and 8 SV per hour. They traveled for 2 hours through the belt, and then they traveled 2 hours more when they returned. This is optimistic, in reality they traveled much slower through the belt because it is a point where they should be slowing down to land on Earth, and it's also the point where they should start to accelerate more after liftoff. But I'm using averages here, just to show you the best scenario for the astronauts. Even if the aircraft was somehow heavily shielded, which it wasn't, look at it. It looks like a homeless person's tent. We've seen better encampments under the freeway. The official width of the module's walls is only three times thicker than the aluminum wall of a soda can. This is 0.012 inches wide. This is over 600 times smaller than my... So I took it upon myself to calculate the radiation levels. For a total of 4 hours of travel time through the radiation belt, the astronauts would still get over double the little dose. Even if the walls of the spacecraft were 10,000 times thicker than they were in reality, the astronauts would still die. The official narrative is that the astronauts received a total radiation of under 1.14 MSV 
This would only be possible if they pass through the Van Allen radiation belt in under 2 minutes, which they didn't. That would suggest a speed of 500,000 miles per hour, which is something impossible to achieve within a few minutes after launch. On all the authentic Apollo 11 footage from the moon, we can see air. You might ask, but wait damn, isn't air invisible? Obviously it is, but the effects it has on its surrounding aren't. All the rover footage on the moon was shot on Earth as well. If we take a look at the sand particles behind the wheels of the moon rovers, we will see that they get thrown in the air, but on the moon there should be no atmosphere. How are then these sand particles suspended in midair? This is an effect we can only observe in the atmosphere. If there was no atmosphere where this was filmed, the particles should have followed a trajectory like this and not get suspended in the air forming a cloud. Another one, the infamous flag. It moves after each movement of the astronauts and it moves consistently. Mythbusters tested this and proved that a flag can in fact move in a vacuum. This flag waving test in a vacuum. And stop. Oh, it's it's moving a lot. <laughs> hey, it's moving a lot. So in the vacuum, the flag moved, you know, not just a little bit. It actually moved quite a bit. So that proves you don't need wind in order to move the flag in a vacuum. So unless someone finds a shot of the flag flapping without an astronaut manipulating the flagpole, it's myth busted. Unless someone finds a shot of the flag flapping without an astronaut manipulating the flagpole, they said. I don't know why they tested this, it's quite obvious it can move. What they said however is that the flag can't move on its own in a vacuum. And if it does, it means it isn't in a vacuum and there is air and wind. This is exactly what we observe in this shot from the 5th Apollo mission, Apollo 15. The astronaut passes near the flag and it waves because of the air current he causes. And for those of you who say he's close and touches it, he isn't. This is the camera that is taking the video. He passed closer to the camera than to the flag. So either there is atmosphere on the moon, or this was shot in the studio. The biggest argument of people who defend the moon landing is that 400,000 people worked on the program. How could it be fake then? But the thing is, governments compartmentalize to prevent information leaks. They could have half the population of the country working on a project without really knowing the end goal. Most people working on a poll didn't need to know whether it was fake or real. Most people working on the project only dealt with a tiny fraction of the work. Very few people, maybe 10, 12, probably knew and had access to all the project details. These would be the NASA director, deputy director, filming crew and astronauts. So let's see what happened with these people. We cannot reach the filming crew because it's top secret obviously, but NASA directors are public figures. At the beginning of the program, NASA's director was super enthusiastic. Year after year, until the end of the program, he felt hopeless. He was certain it was impossible to send people to the moon by 1969. He said that several times during interviews, and just five months before the landing itself, he quit. His deputy, Robert Siemens, also left in the very same year before the moon landing itself. Imagine working on a project for 10 years, the biggest project in the world the biggest project in your life, and then leaving before this conclusion. Why? Well, because the project took a spin toward an alternative direction. Robert Siemens also left the same year. The only physical proof of the moon landing is the lunar rock the astronauts brought back. This is the most compelling evidence. The composition of the moon rocks presented this, in fact, from the moon. They are not in any way originating from Earth. NASA didn't fake this one. Does that, however, necessarily mean humans retrieved them. I'm not saying we sent robots or monkeys, but think for a minute. 
There are many meteorites from the moon that landed in Antarctica and in several deserts on Earth. Some of these meteorites have the same composition as the lunar surface. They originated from the moon and landed here. Well, I got a phone call once, a fellow with the Smithsonian, and he said, Jerry, we have now a meteorite which I just brought back from Antarctica, which is from the moon. The whole assembly of scientists attacked this object, and at the end of a year and a half, the conclusion was, it was a moon rock. It was unambiguously a moon rock. There's a weird coincidence here. In 1967, one year before the Apollo missions, NASA sent several teams to Antarctica on a mission to retrieve moon meteorites. So it's pretty straightforward for them to use the moon meteorites retrieved from Antarctica as proof for the moon visit. If they needed to do it. I'm not saying that happened. Nobody can prove that happened. I'm just telling you how I would fake it if I had to. And I think the vast majority of the hundreds of pounds of moon rocks that we claim to have are made here on Earth. They can be irradiated or exposed to a vacuum or uh, modified in certain minor ways so that they appear slightly different. In 2009, independent researchers discovered that the lunar rock that was donated to a Dutch museum was in reality a piece of petrified wood, a fig. It was presented as a precious moon rock, but it wasn't. The footage being fake doesn't necessarily prove we never went to the moon. But now that we know it was fake, let's see why it is fake and how they did it. JFK proposed to the Soviets that the two great nations combine efforts and fly to the moon together. But Khrushchev declined with these words. Present time, we do not plan flights of cosmonauts to the moon. I have read a report that the Americans wish to land on the moon by 1970. Well, let's wish them success, and we will see how they fly there, and how they will land there, or to be more correct, moon there. So the common misconception that it was a space race to the moon is not entirely accurate. Do you know how much money went into the space program? In today's money around 300 billion dollars. More than half could have easily been stolen. In the 400,000 people that worked on it for 10 years, well, this is another place the maths don't add up again. Calculating after inflation in today's money, these people would receive on average $7,500 for the 10 years they worked. For the entire 10 years. This is after inflation. That's two dollars per day in today's money. Do you wanna convince me that 400,000 people, skilled engineers, the brightest minds in America, in the world, worked for four times cheaper than fast food workers get? I don't believe anyone can convince me with these numbers, I'm sorry. The truth is always in the numbers. The exploration was driven by greed. The US perhaps succeeded in reaching the moon, but not through the Apollo spacecrafts, and I'm sure no people set foot there in the Apollo spacecrafts. I believe NASA really landed on the moon, but without people aboard. They found something frightening, and since they had already made their intentions public beforehand, there was no going back. The true motive was perhaps to conceal what they found. The Apollo program started with very good intentions, but it was over before it even started. In 1961, during the first attempt to send men into orbit, the rocket exploded mid-test. Then, a week later, they tested again. This time, with humans inside the module, three brave astronauts burned alive and died in the capsule. After this tragic event, the program naturally started to deteriorate. Staff was quitting their jobs, everyone was demoralized. Perhaps at some point, they realized it was not doable and went another route. An alternative one that would still have the same impact on humanity and would be much cheaper instead. Filming it all in a studio and later visiting the moon to realize the true purpose behind closed doors without all the external pressure. We proved all the video and audio footage was fake, fabricated in a studio on Earth. But we must resort to re-evaluating the lunar rocks the astronauts brought. In the six missions, NASA brought almost 400 kilograms, around a thousand pounds of lunar rocks on Earth. The mass of all the combined lunar meteorites found on Earth 
is twice that, 2400 pounds. But it would still be very ballsy to steal 40% of it and use it as cover. So I would rule they did get the rocks from the moon. But since physics doesn't allow people to travel there so easily, I don't believe we've ever set our biological feet on the lunar surface, not through the Apollo spaceships. You're hiding something. Let me know in the comments if you want to find out what. And if you're into cover-ups and space, you would be amazed to find out that everything you know about aliens and UFOs might be wrong. See you in the next video.